Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we are reviewing Talking to Strangers by Malcolm Gladwell. What we should know about the people we don't know. I'd say one of the most uh, popular authors in the world in the, to the general public. And uh, this is his brand new book, Talking to Strangers, after a bit of a hiatus of not writing books, but after books like we did Outliers back in season three, which is a massive book. So we've had our eye on this book for a while, being Malcolm Gladwell. We know it's going to be very popular, hence uh, we're reviewing it and it's just recently been released. This one is, as the subtitle suggests, all about the people that we don't know. So the people that we interact with that we've maybe never interacted with before or only just interacted on a surface level and how well can we understand these people. And he sets us up with a couple of puzzles that sort of uh, highlight some of the problems we face when talking to strangers. The first story goes back to the communist regime. And there was a Cuban intelligence officer who was working all over the world spreading this ideology. But he grew tired of Fidel Castro. He began to dislike him as a person and the way that he was doing his operations. So what this dude tried to do, he decided to jump ship. He's all, he's all over com- communism. And he betrayed Cuba by telling the US everything he knew about Cuba's international operations. So this dude was, he was working in Czechoslovakia at the time, I guess undercover for the Cubans. And he, he drove out, escaped with his girlfriend in the trunk and drove to Germany, where, which was the closest US embassy. And he walked into the embassy and he said he wanted to talk to this dude called a mountain climber who was the highest ranking official there. And when he finally got a face-to-face meeting with the mountain climber, he literally told them everything about Cuba's infiltration of the CIA. He revealed how much the Cubans had sort of injected themselves into the CIA's international operations. He told them about all of these double agents that were working for the CIA by day, but they were taking meticulous notes every single day, and everything that happened during that day would be sent back to Cuba every single night. So this dude seriously betrayed Fidel Castro, but what did Fidel Castro do about this? Once he knew that the whole jig was up and everything was exposed, he actually decided to rub salt in the wounds of the US and you know exploit this opportunity. He created a special television program to show all around Cuba, exposing how stupid the Americans were and how they so easily infiltrated their whole entire operation. So remember, this is the CIA, right? Like the most Hmm. stereotypical uh, undercover just intelligence organization, you know, who we put on the pedestal as being one of the the most well-informed and, you know, intelligent organizations on the planet. So on this television show, they revealed how a lot of the US secrets and showed them on national TV as well, showing them how they, just showing how they beat the US at their own game. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's not like a, you know, if it was some old entrenched organization that somebody had infiltrated, but this was the CIA. This is meant to be the most intelligent organization in the world. Their whole job is to try to understand strangers, to try and understand people's motives, to try and catch people out doing the wrong thing. And whilst they were looking out for, you know, the, the bad guys, they a few bad guys snuck in the back door and had actually completely infiltrated their own organization. And these people, you know, they when they looked back through all the records of these double agents and all of their regular reviews that the CIA had done with their agents, not a single red flag was dis- was detected. So there was no suspicious activity from anyone inside the CIA who was, you know, doing regular reports on their agents to say, maybe this guy's a little bit sus, not a single one. And so it's pretty crazy to think that these people were able to somehow infiltrate the CIA and trick everybody who is meant to be part of this most intelligent organization. So that's sort of puzzle number one, is why can't we tell when a stranger right in front of us is lying to our face? Gladwell follows with the second puzzle here. Back in April 1938, just before the Second World War, and around this time, there were a few murmurs and a bit of tension happening around the world, especially with Hitler and Germany and the the risks of them actually invading the German-speaking portion of Czechoslovakia. So England's Prime Minister at the time, Neville Chamberlain, he thought, all right, we better go and meet this dude, Hitler, and you know see what he's all about and see what risk he posed for the, the rest of the world and uh, setting off another world war. Yeah, it was an interesting time. Hitler was actually the Time Magazine Man of the Year in 1938, the year before the World War started, and really not many of the world's major leaders knew anything about him. So the US President, Franklin Roosevelt, he never met him. Joseph Stalin never met him. Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister after Chamberlain, he tried to meet him twice over tea, 
uh, a few years before, but Hitler stood him up both times. So none of these major world leaders had met him, and they're all a little bit suspicious of him. But contrast that to Neville Chamberlain, who thought, okay, I better go sort this out. I better go meet him face-to-face, try and work out what he's all about. So he decided to have a few face-to-face meetings with him. And what he said to the press after one of these meetings, he said that, I feel like I'd established a certain confidence, which was my aim. And on my side, despite this guy's hardness and ruthlessness, I saw in his face and I got the impression that this was a man who could be relied upon when he had given his word. And then Chamberlain said that, I felt like... Both of us fully understand what is on each other's minds. And uh, about six months later, we know how that went. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chamberlain was a bit off the mark there. A the, bit of the benefit of hindsight. And Chamberlain's a, st- a stand-up dude. He does what most people do. Is, you know, you look him in the eye, observe their demeanor, their behavior, and then, you dr- and then you draw conclusions based on this information that you have in these one-on-one interactions. Yeah, it's, think of it like a, a job interview as well. What most companies do is, you know, they'll have different interviews, different rounds of interviews, maybe group interviews, one-on-one interviews, uh, a whole range of people who are looking at the job applicants and the candidates, trying to get a sense of them as a person and through, you know, some kind of surface level discussions, try to understand are they going to be a good employee? Are they going to be a good leader? Are they going to be a good worker? They're all, we're trying to understand these strangers just from a few of these interactions and that's what companies are doing and you know sometimes it works out well but it's probably not the best way to truly understand someone and Chamberlain sort of fell under this same spell he'd met this dude a couple of times he looked in his eye he'd shaken his hand and he got a sense of this person and tried to understand where he's coming from and what his motives were and he was completely way off the mark so we think that this extra personal information we're trying to gather will really help us understand strangers much better but it really does the opposite So this is the second puzzle. How is it that meeting a stranger can sometimes make us worse and making sense of that person rather than not meeting them? So what we've got here, we've got these CIA officers who can't make sense of if their spies are on their side or on on the enemy side. We've got prime ministers who can't understand their adversaries and of course that leads to some pretty serious consequences later on. We've got people who are struggling in their first impressions of a stranger. We've got people who are struggling when they've had months to understand a stranger. We've got people struggling when they've met someone only once, but also struggling when they've met them multiple times. We've got people struggling to assess a stranger's honesty, their character, their intent. It's a complete mess. And these are some of the, if these are some of the people at the top of the world, then the everyday person is going to struggle just as much, if not more. So this whole book and the rest of the book is about some of the reasons as to why strangers are so difficult to understand. Gladwell illustrates something called truth default theory through a few studies. The first study, what they did is they invited students to a lab and give them a trivia test with a cash prize. And they're given a partner to work with to answer some of the questions. But like all these kind of studies, the partner was a bit of an undercover uh, part of the study as well. And, you know, they're trying to infiltrate the other person into cheating, you know, and saying, oh, I could really use with a 20 or 30 bucks to win this test. And then obviously some people in the population like Asho here, they'd fall into the cheating on the test. <laughs> and then the better part of the population, you know, some people are honest and they don't end up cheating. And importantly was afterwards, obviously they had a few people monitoring this situation and what they did afterwards, it wasn't a test to see if people cheated or not, it was a test to see what they did afterwards. So afterwards they were asked, did you cheat? And you know, some people were uh, a bit flimsy, some people say, oh, no, no, I didn't, I, no, not really, I didn't cheat. Whereas some people would like, be like, no, I didn't cheat at all. Ask my partner, they would tell you the exact same thing. So there was a real range of responses here from sort of very fragile to very confident And across this whole range, there was a bunch of liars and cheaters who were very confident. There was liars and cheaters who were very not confident. There was people telling the truth who were very confident. There was people telling the truth who were very not confident. So it was really very difficult to really try to understand if somebody was telling the truth or not. Next, they extended the study. So they had videos of 22 liars and 22 truth tellers. And this part of the study took another group who analyzed these videos and they made a decision whether the people on the video, whether they were a liar or whether they were telling the truth. And interestingly, people correctly identify the liars only 54% of the time. So it's basically just a little bit better than a coin flip in terms of guessing who the liars were. It's pretty crazy to, you know, to watch all these videos and to try to determine if someone was lying or telling the truth about whether they cheated or not. And for only to only get 54% correct, you'd think it might be pretty obvious 
to work out if somebody was lying or not. You think there might be some obvious things they do or don't do that are real giveaways. And what they found out was that, you know, you might think because it's 50%, you're getting half of the lies right, half of the truth tellers right. What they actually found was people were really, really good at working out when someone was telling the truth. So they were way above 50% in identifying truth tellers, but they were really, really bad at working out when someone was lying. So they were, you know, below 30% of working out if somebody was lying or not. And this is what he calls truth default theory. And so we all default to truth. Most of the time, we think people are going to be telling us the truth. And the only time that we think they might not be telling us the truth is if there's some kind of trigger that prompts us to analyze what they're doing. And most of the time, if these triggers aren't strong enough, we just assume people are telling the truth. We just default to the fact that people are telling the truth. Next, they showed the videos to a bunch of law enforcement agents. So these people have over 15 years of interrogation experience. They were well tuned to dealing and looking at people in these situations. So you'd really expect them to do much better than average. It turns out in some cases they perform perfectly and in some cases they perform abysmally. All right, so you've got two types of people. You've got match senders. So these people look honest and they are honest and then you've got unmatched senders. And in this case, they might look honest and but in reality, they're dodgy or vice versa. So what they're showing isn't what's necessarily happening under the hood for the unmatched. So the cases where it was matched, where honest people looked honest, they got 100% correct. But the times when it was unmatched, so the honest people looked dishonest or vice versa, they only got 20% right. Yeah, that's pretty crazy that, you know, obviously if a liar looks dodgy or a truth teller looks sincere, then these law enforcement guys, they got it correct 100% of the time. But when they were unmatched, when it was either a liar who looked sincere or a truth teller who looked nervous, they only got it correct 20% of the time. And in fact, the liars, they only detected 14% of the liars who looked like they were telling the truth. And the thing here is like, we don't really need help with matched people. If there's a uh, a liar who looks like a liar, most of us can probably work that out. We need help from the law enforcement guys when somebody is lying, but they look like they're telling the truth. Uh, and that's where they performed just as bad as a normal person with. We really default to truth because for our society to operate, we need to feel like we can trust all the people around us. Like if you're a parent, you need to be able to trust that you can just drop your kid off to the your, your sons and your daughters uh, footy training or whatever it might be and trust the person who's in charge. If every coach we assumed was a pedophile, like, like the very small percentage of society who are the bad eggs, then we really wouldn't be able to let the kids leave the house even. Yeah, exactly. We need to default to truth really in order for society to, to operate. We need to trust the people around us. He goes into a deep dive about the, the recent Jerry Sandusky case who was a football coach who was having nude showers with 12-year-old boys and... Uh, and there was an, another guy called Larry Nassar, or Larry Nassar, who was the, the USA gymnastics doctor. And uh, obviously, gymnastics takes a bit of a toll on people's bodies. But this guy was maybe taking some interesting approaches. Like he was giving the young girls pelvic floor massages, which is where he inserted his fingers into their vagina without gloves, without consent, and gave an enthusiastic massage to release and relax their pelvic floor. Um, he was also doing breast massages, unnecessary um, anal examinations. So after a while, it built up and this guy had been doing this for decades and eventually they worked out that he was probably not doing the correct medical procedures. So again, that's a trust issue with the truth default theory. Recently watched Michael Jackson's uh, documentary again and some parents were leaving their kids with Michael Jackson overnight and we've got the benefit of hindsight of watching this documentary, but those people in the time, they think it's Michael Jackson, the person who can do the moonwalk and you know the whole mm. world loves him so much. They'll just assume again that Michael Jackson's the type of person who is very trustworthy and we all know how that ended. Yeah, and so Malcolm Gladwell's sort of recommendation or takeaway here is that you know if things like this happen, you know, it's a Jerry Sandusky, it's a Larry Nassar, it's a Michael Jackson... All of us have this truth default theory and rather than us jumping on the victim and saying, oh, you should have known, you know, this, why did you leave your kids with this creepy old guy? Uh, you should have known, you should have known better, you should have listened to your kids more. Really, that's what everyone does. So Gladwell says that rather than judging these people, we really need to sympathize with them to realize that any of us in this position probably would have done the exact same thing. 
So we're not the best with strangers and that's what we've been learning th- so far through this book. Gladwell also talks about how we struggle with transparency in people's actions. If you watch the TV show Friends, all these people are actors. Everything they do and all their facial reactions and everything, it's entirely transparent. You really don't even need any audio f- to watch this show to understand what's actually going on. He talks about this idea of transparency in people's behavior and their demeanor, meaning that the way they represent themselves on the outside, we think that provides an authentic window into the way they feel on the inside. And so on Friends, that's very obvious. You know, if uh, when Ross walked in on uh, Chandler and Monica, uh, you know, was Ross his best friend with his sister? He was clearly visibly shocked. You know, his, his jaw dropped, his eyes went up and you could see on his face that he was shocked and surprised. And then that probably shifted into a little bit of anger where his brow furrowed up and his mouth sort of tensed a little bit. So you can see just from these facial expressions, we knew exactly what was going on on the inside. And on a TV show with actors, there it's almost 100% correlation between what their face says that they're feeling and what they're actually feeling. But in the real world, it's actually very, very hard to follow because our face doesn't always follow these traditional expected uh, reactions as to what we're feeling on the inside. Yes, we've all learned the ability to put on certain masks and put on a bit of a poker face and not let the emotions that you're feeling on the inside actually shine through to the other person. And to make it even more difficult when you're looking at strangers, it differs by culture as well. So this has been actually studied by a by Sergio Yarillo, by Sergio Carrillo, <laughs> a, a Spanish. Maybe you haven't learned Spanish. Double L is a Y, and I didn't a J that. is a H. I didn't, I didn't know about the but I like the... I reckon I got pretty close. I reckon if you, as a general rule, if we're not sure how to pronounce something, if you add some kind of flair flavors, to it, yeah, yeah, then bit, you probably get away with it. Add a bit of flavor it. to it and it makes it sound a bit more legitimate. <laughs> so, really, he did a, a study of different cultures around the world and how they interpreted different facial expressions. So, the study involved some photos of happy people smiling, sad people pouting, angry people scowling, fear people gasping, disgusted people with a nose crunching and people just having a neutral face. And what they did was they tested these photos uh, with Spanish school children. So they showed these Spanish school children somebody smiling and 100% of the school children said that this person was happy. They showed someone pouting and 98% of the school children said that this person was sad and so on. And, you know, they were above 90% to identify all of these uh, facial reactions. But confusingly was when this same dude, I forget how you pronounce it, but this same dude went to the Trobriand Islands, which is this remote cluster of islands 100 miles off the coast of Papua New Guinea. They showed these uh, adult tribes people the exact same photos. And when they showed someone the picture of somebody smiling, 58% of them said that they were happy and 23% of them said they were neutral. So you've got Spanish school children with 100% accuracy saying happy, but only 58% of adults were able to identify this as happy. If you look at the angry face... 91% of school children identify this as angry, but on the Trobian Islands, only 7% of people identify this face as anger. So obviously, culturally, the facial expressions that these people in off the coast of Papua New Guinea use are completely different to the facial expressions that we use in the West. So obviously, interpreting emotions differs differs based on the background of what your culture might be. So I reckon if you got these Trobrian Islanders and got them on the couch to watch a bit of Friends and put it on mute like we were saying before, they'll probably struggle to have any idea mm. what's going on. The plots they'll come up with would probably end up being bizarre. You know, If they're identifying anger at only 7% based on what our Western culture uh, style is. That's another area that we probably think that we're good at is understanding transparency of people's emotions. But in reality, it's much more complex and nuanced than we might think. So they're two of our major drawbacks or misgivings when we're trying to work out strangers. The first that we talked about was defaulting to truth in that assuming most people were telling the truth unless there was an obvious trigger otherwise. The other was transparency, thinking that just by looking at someone, we can, try and we can understand more about what they're thinking. And the third one that Gladwell talks about is this phenomenon called coupling, saying that if we're just looking at the person as an individual, we're probably missing a lot of the story and instead we should be looking at uh, more of the broader things around the person. He looks at the phenomena of coupling through studies on suicide rates. In the years after the First World War, many British homes out there began to use what was called town gas to power their stoves and their water heaters. 
So this was manufactured by coal and it was a mixture of a variety of different compounds like hydrogen, methane, carbon dioxide. All this shit put together is really poisonous stuff enough to kill you if you just locked yourself into a garage and left the, the put the car on and let the exhaust fumes go around everywhere. You'd be out in 15 minutes. Yeah, what they found was because of this uh, this deadly gas was that there were a lot of uh, suicide victims that they found, you know, with their... Uh, head covered in coats or blankets and with the tube from the gas tap underneath and it, it was a pretty quick way to die. I guess the most uh, well-known case is the poet named Sylvia Plath uh, who had the book the, the Bell Jar which was almost like a just before a suicide and it sort of revealed a lot about what she was thinking there. But what they found around this time of you know Sylvia Plath committed suicide in 1962 in England and Wales there were 5,588 people who committed suicide and 2,500 of those, that's 44%, killed themselves using this same method, which was, you know, this carbon monoxide gas asphyxiation. And, you know, that's 44% of suicides using this same method. That's, that's pretty crazy. It was the most lethal form of self-harm, significantly outstripping other methods like, you know, guns or self-harm or overdosing on pills or jumping off a bridge or anything like that. In the 1960s, the British energy system began to undergo some serious change in cleaning up how they procured their energy. So they replaced this poisonous concoction with all this, this poisonous shit put together with just simple natural gas, which isn't enough to, to kill people. So it was generally phased out up until about 1976. So then at this time of this energy transition, they looked at the graph of the number of suicides and the differences and in the changes. And it turns out that the decrease in suicides in general, was equal to the decrease and the elimination of suicides from the lethal gas. That's pretty crazy. Obviously, this one method of suicide was being phased out. And obviously, with the decrease of this town gas, then gas suicide significantly decreased. But I guess what you would probably think is that if there are these people who are looking to commit suicide through one method, if this one method, this gas suicide disappears, these people are could probably look for some other way to do it. There might be other a whole bunch of potential methods out there if they really wanted to kill themselves. But And what you would think is that the sort of graph of suicides would be pretty consistent or pretty flat throughout. But what they found was that there was a big spike up when they introduced this town gas and then there was a big drop off after they removed this town gas. And so what Gladwell said is that suicide is coupled to the physical environment around us. One of the reports on this showed that things like hanging and drowning or shooting, stabbing, crashing your car, jumping off a high place or anything like that requires some kind of courage and a lot of planning and preparation to attempt suicide in this manner. And gas suicides, in contrast, were much more simple. And when they removed this means of, of suicide, then these people didn't transition to one of these ways where it required so much more effort into into the planning yeah that report that you talked about obviously was very matter of fact that it wasn't some kind of attempt to dissect the root cause of people's pain or and wasn't speaking empathetically about suicide at all what they were doing was they were purely looking at this problem like a mechanical or an engineering problem like they saw a problem they saw a way to fix it and once they reduced this one method people weren't looking out there for other methods of of uh, achieving the same means Another similar example to this is the Golden Gate Bridge. So since opening in 1937, more than 1,500 people have committed suicide by jumping off the bridge. And that's significantly more than any other single place in the world in this time period. There's this one dude named Richard Sidon who was doing some detective work. Between 1937 and 1971, he found uh, 515 people who had attempted to jump from the bridge but had somehow been unexpectedly restrained or stopped at the last moment. So this psychologist followed up with these people who had wanted to jump but had been stopped by someone for some reason. And what he found was that only 25 of these people, not 25%, 25 people, less than 5%, had actually persisted in killing themselves by some other method. So overwhelmingly, the people that wanted to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge at a given moment wanted to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge only at that given moment. 95% of the people who wanted to commit suicide and went to jump off the bridge actually turned out that they didn't end up committing suicide later on. So it's kind of interesting if you just look at the surface level of what people are trying to do. They're really influenced by this coupling phenomena and the context of what's actually happening in the environment. 
mate, we're, we're approaching the end of this episode. It's a bit of a morbid way to end on there. <laughs> it really is. I don't <laughs> know if there's a lighter one that we can lift I guess it up. we could say that uh, a lot of lives were saved. We can frame yeah. it that way. <laughs> yes. Through understanding this phenomena and all these measures put on the Golden Gate Bridge. So, yeah, it's a bit of a, a, bit of a happier way to frame the end of the day so people can go on and in, enjoy the rest of their day. Yes. It took about 80 years, but there's now a net underneath that was uh, installed in 2018. I yeah. guess to catch people. It's a better result now that it's catching people, probably bouncing up and down a few times. Yeah, a bit of a trampoline. A bit of a trampoline. <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I don't know if we should joke about that. I don't know if we <laughs> did it better. Well, it, was, it was an attempt anyway. But let's just as a quick recap. Obviously, we've we've talked about a few of the puzzles as to why we can't understand people that, that as well as we think we could. Things like you know defaulting to truth and this illusion of transparency. These have to do with our inability to make sense of the stranger as an individual. And then on top of these, we add another error, which is looking at just the individual themselves and not taking into account the context into which the stranger is operating. So in true Gladwellian style, there's no specific, clear, obvious how-to or lesson or takeaway. It's just something very important to think about and to start to recognize that you can't understand strangers anywhere near as well as you believe that you can.